So, you guys wanted it, and here it is. Today, I am going to teach you guys about the direct 3D part of the framework. I'm going to show you how it works. I'm going to break it down line by line. Uh, you're probably going to be I don't know, surprised at how simple it is. But even though it's simple to fully understand it, it really helps to understand the underlying uh, hardware and software systems uh, in the graphics infrastructure of a modern PC. In order to understand that kind of thing, it, it also helps to understand uh, basically the history of graphics in IBM type personal computers. So, we're going to go over a little... Uh, technological history lesson. Let's see if I can't get rid of this. All delete. Wait. I gotta click the window first. All delete and deselect. Okay. I'm gonna put a layer up here just to make sure. Just to be safe. Alright, so uh, I think I talked about the basics of a uh, of a video card in lesson 13 when we uh, redid the put pixel call but I think it wouldn't hurt to go over that again just uh, just to be safe so we got a uh, we got a CPU and let's say over here How do I want to do this? We'll do it like this. Over here... No, that's no good. Over here. Here we have a, uh, a computer, a monitor. Very old-fashioned monitor. And it's got its... Uh, this is supposed to be a VGA plug, right? And the VGA plug takes, you know, certain kinds of signals. These are signals here. Oh, we're setting the bar high today for diagrams. So here's our here's our VGA monitor with some some graphics on it. Now, the goal is to get data on a CPU. The CPU is like data in bytes and and words and stuff like that. Uh, and to get that kind of data, that binary data onto this monitor which is an inherently uh, analog thing although today's monitors are LCD but whatever uh, and the way we do that is we have a little uh, a little doohickey that we call graphics adapter so here's our graphics adapter and it has a little thing here and we'll call that little thing the uh, the RAM DAC, Random Access Memory Digital to Analog Converter, and it uh, it translates digital data bytes into signals that the monitor can use. Now, the simplest way you could conceive of uh, doing graphics is you would have the CPU whenever a new pixel needs to be put on the screen uh, how to say this well let me put it this way the way a monitor works or the way monitors used to work and kind of the model that they're even built on today is it would start from here top left hand corner of the screen it would scan to the right drawing pixels and then when it got the end of the line it would go back here and then scan 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 and when it got to the the bottom right hand corner it would go back here and start over and over and over again it would just scan lines alright uh, that's the basic operating principles of an old CRT monitor and to a certain degree, like I said, even today's monitors have some of that uh, left over in them. So what would happen is, as this thing is scanning, when it gets to a new pixel, it needs new data. And the easiest way to do that would be uh, 
to have the CPU at the correct timing send out bytes to this uh, RAM DAC device, which would then have output a signal and control the electron beam so that it puts the right color on the screen. The problem with that is that you'd have to have the CPU would have to spend a lot of time just sending out the bytes at the exact appropriate time, the exact right timing to get the uh, all the pixels aligned properly on the screen. And that would waste a lot of CPU time. Your CPU would be spending, you know, more than half of its time just um, getting interrupted and having to send out a a, uh, a byte at the exact timing. So the way to get around that is instead of having the CPU send the uh, data to the RAM DAC, you would have some memory here. We'll call it video memory. We'll call it VRAM. Oh god. F we'll just fail at writing in the English language here. VRAM. And if you have this VRAM here, um, what happens is the RAM DAC will read the VRAM directly. The VRAM will contain all the pixels for the screen and the RAM DAC just reads the VRAM and uh, uses that to draw the screen and now the CPU doesn't have to do anything. And that is a very good arrangement except of course the CPU still has to be able to change the VRAM otherwise you won't be the CPU won't be able to communicate with the monitor. So you need a connection here. And the way they did it was they had something called the uh, the North Bridge, which was a memory controller. So you had your CPU, and it would it would be connected to the by a uh, a bus. It's called the front side bus. To something called the North Bridge, which was a memory controller, and the North Bridge would connect to um, say the RAM. And it would also connect to something, we'll call this the south bridge. And the south bridge might connect to, uh, might connect to your, your keyboard and your, uh, and your mouse and all your, happy, all your happy shit that you got there. And it would also connect to something, It would connect to your peripheral bus, so it might be uh, it might be PCI or it might be ISA, old style peripheral buses, and then your devices would connect to this bus. So you'd have other devices on here too. You might have a, uh, for example, just a, you might have your sound card on this bus too. There's your uh, your sound. Your sound blaster, and so forth. Um, so here you have your 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 peripheral bus. You've got your devices connected to it, and that's connected to here. So the CPU accesses this stuff um, well in one of two ways, but the only way we'll talk about here is it accesses it via memory. So in the CPU, it sees a big memory space. And like I said before, all this memory space, this addressable memory space, the North Bridge, or the uh, memory controller, will assign different devices, different spaces in this memory space. So you might have your RAM might be from, uh, from here to here. So this is RAM. And I don't know, maybe from here to here is your uh, fucker. Hmm. I don't want to put this diagram here. I want to put this diagram over here. Because then I'll have more space to do stuff later. That's thinking with your noggin. Okay, so here you have your. RAM 
and maybe here you have your VRAM and I don't know here you might have some space for your uh, your sound card and here you might have a little space for your uh, your Ethernet or something whatever so all this address space that the CPU sees as its memory is actually uh, allotted to different devices you got some allotted to your RAM, some allotted to your video card which is mostly video RAM and again other devices All right. and so when the CPU wants to change some of this uh, I don't know this data in the video RAM it just moves data into one of these addresses so it has a pointer to some address here and it moves data into here and that data the north bridge will say oh that's uh, for the the thing over here and then the south bridge will say that's for the the video card and then it goes into here so the data gets routed to different devices depending on the address and that is how that works so this is your your very uh, basic graphics adapter system it adapts the CPU to the uh, the monitor and it allows the CPU to communicate with the user via graphics. Now, there are some problems with this system. First of all, generally RAM can only be accessed by one device at a time. So if the RAM DAC is scanning across here and constantly getting bytes from the RAM, the CPU can't access the RAM. So it can't actually write to the RAM even though it's connected to it because the RAM DAC is always using the RAM. The only time the RAM DAC isn't using the RAM is when it gets to the bottom right hand corner and the uh, the laser has, or not the laser, the electron beam has to move to the top left hand corner when the electron beam is moving along here, it doesn't read any data from the RAM. So during that time, the VRAM is free. And that time frame when the electron beam is moving from here to here, that's called uh, V-blank. So with this current setup, the only time the CPU can draw to the video memory is during v-blank maybe during like a few milliseconds out of every uh, every frame so the amount of shit it can draw into the screen is really uh, I don't know it's limited I mean back in the day comp CPUs were slow memory was slow and considering that if you could only draw during the v-blank that's not a lot of stuff that you can draw but there were systems that worked like that. Many video game consoles, early consoles, they only allowed accessing the memory during a uh, during a V blank. Um, so that limited the amount of stuff that you can do on the screen. One of the ways that they combated this was, I mean, with the uh, with the framework, with what I've been showing you guys, is when you want to draw a scene on the screen. Um, what you would do is you would draw your background stuff if you have any background and then you draw all your sprites right back to front so the stuff closer or the stuff that's going to be on top you would draw later right and so you'd compose your entire scene and then when that was done and you had to go to the next frame you'd erase it and then you draw it all again, right? And you just repeat that every frame. But back in the day, they didn't have time to redraw the entire frame every frame. Yeah. Redraw the entire scene every frame. So what they did was they drew, like, like if you had, like, Pac-Man, like, they would draw your maze and shit. I just, this does not look like Pac-Man. Imagine that this was Pac-Man and not just some fucked up drawing by, by me. Right? And you got your, like, your little dots and shit. So you draw your scene. And then you draw your sprites. And then when you went when you went to the next frame, you would simply erase any sprites that have moved. 
you'd erase that one and then draw it over here. And you'd like you'd erase, uh, go back over here. You'd erase this one and then you'd draw it over here, right? So by doing that, you would uh, save on a lot of uh, memory accesses and you'd manage to fit it all within the, uh, the V blank. Even saying that, I mean the old Atari systems and stuff like that, they couldn't draw all the ghosts on the screen at the same time because it didn't have enough time. There was only like maybe like one Pac-Man and like three or four ghosts, right? And they couldn't do it. That's how fucking slow that shit was. And I mean the resolution was really slow. There wasn't very many pixels to a ghost at all. But that's the way it was. So they would draw only what changed. You would erase your sprites and then you draw them over again. Your background would stay static for the most part. Um, and that was easy because the backgrounds are all black and everything. So later on when you had actual graphical backgrounds, like actual backgrounds with like shit in it, scenery and stuff, and then you draw a sprite over top of that, what you would do is you would actually save the stuff that was underneath the sprite. You would have like a little thing here and you would like save that shit and then when you wanted to move the sprite, you'd erase the sprite here, or you wouldn't erase it, you'd just basically copy the stuff that you saved back to where it was before you drew the sprite, and then you'd draw the sprite here, and you'd save what was underneath it. So you'd, you'd save, you, you had a mask, and you would, uh, you'd save the stuff that was uh, under where you're going to draw the sprite, and then you'd copy the sprite. And then later on, you'd mask the stuff that you saved back onto the old spot, and then you'd draw the sprite in a new spot. So those are all the shit that they did to uh, basically save on having to redraw the entire screen. And especially in this beginning situation here, you couldn't draw the entire screen because you only had that little time in V-Blank to, to access the video memory. Impossible. So how do we fix this problem? How do we improve on the system? Well, I guess the first improvement is you could create RAM DP and that does not mean double penetration by the way that means dual port you could create a RAM that has two ports of access so that the RAM DAC can access the RAM at the same time that the CPU is accessing the CPU does not have to wait until the RAM is free so that's called dual port RAM or graphics RAM GD RAM and that allowed the CPU to access the RAM at the same time that the RAM DAC was drawing it onto the screen. And that gives you way, way more time to draw a scene. But there is a flaw in that situation. Uh, can you think of what it is? Imagine you have a scene, right? So ideally, you would draw your object in your scene, you draw your triangle, you draw your circle, and you draw your square. And then the, uh, the RAM DAC would scan through your screen and fire that uh, data out as a signal to the uh, video monitor where it'd be displayed, right? So it would scan through your graphics memory and display that onto the screen. But the thing is, is as you're drawing this shit, the RAM DAC is already scanning through your scene. So what happens if, for example, you start drawing a scene and your RAM DAC has already scanned down to here. So here's your video memory. Here's your monitor, right? So your RAM DAC has already scanned down to this point here. So what you're going to get on your monitor is well basically here's your old scene from the previous frame okay so here it is on the monitor now your RAM DAC is already scanned down here so it's replaced all these pixels in here now you start to change your scene so now you erase all this shit. Let's say you're going to erase everything and redraw. So you erase all your objects and you start drawing. You might draw your 
your uh, triangle first, and your triangle has moved to the right somewhat. But as you're drawing your triangle, Ramdak has already moved down to here. So it started drawing, redrawing this part, but the part that it drew was it was a been it had been erased, so it's just a blank screen. So now your Ramdak draws this scene onto this screen. So it moved from here to here, or from here to here, here to here, and now you have this big blank spot. And so now you draw your your triangle. But your triangle has actually moved to, uh, I don't know, to the right. So now you're going to draw your triangle here. And while you draw your triangle, your ramdac moves down a little bit further. So what you get is you might get something like this. Now the bottom part of your triangle is like not aligned with the top part of your triangle. Right? They're misaligned. And this part of the circle is all done. Now you draw your circle here, but Ramdak has already finished scanning, so there's nothing left there. So the bottom part of your circle is gone. And maybe the Ramdak gets down to here. Now you draw uh, your square, and we'll say your square moved to the left or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. You draw your square, but by the time you're finished drawing your square, Ramdak only catches the the last part of it, so you might only get like the bottom half of your square. So look at this. Now your your scene's all fucked up because Ramdak was like updating the screen while you were in the middle of drawing a frame. And depending on where the uh, where the Ramdak starts during your frame, you're going to get different parts of your scene missing, and you're going to basically get a bunch of flickering sprites all over your scene. It's going to look fucking horrible. It's going to look like a bag of dicks is what it's going to look like. So that situation is obviously not something that you want. But what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? Well, you could uh, say, okay, we're only going to draw during uh, V-blank. But then you're back to where you started. That's a horrible idea. So what's the solution? I'm going to tell you what the solution is. You, in, you, you, make, you give yourself more VRAM. You double the amount of VRAM you have. All right? So before you had just enough VRAM to hold the screen data, and you called that your frame buffer. That was a, called a frame buffer because it, it holds the, uh, the, f the current frame before it's being sent to the, uh, the monitor. So you double your RAM, and now you have enough RAM for two frame buffers. We'll call this the uh, the front buffer and the back buffer. So you got your front buffer and your back buffer. And what you do is you have a scene in your front buffer. Call this your front buffer. And your RAM deck is uh, it's scanning through here and drawing the scene onto the screen. All right. And while the RAM deck is is sending the scene from your front buffer to the monitor, you're busy drawing the next scene in your back buffer. So this is the uh, the front buffer, and this is the back buffer. And you're busy drawing the next scene, so maybe you've only gotten uh, this far in drawing your your back buffer so far. You don't touch the scene in your front buffer. You never touch that. You only draw in your back buffer. And what happens is when you are finished drawing on your back buffer, then you tell the RAM DAC, okay, now the RAM DAC has been scanning from this buffer. And you tell the RAM DAC, now I want you to scan from this buffer. So the buffer that was your back buffer, that becomes your new front buffer.
and your old front buffer this is now the back buffer so when this is all finished drawing and it's all put onto the screen then you say okay this is now the back buffer and this is now the front buffer and now the RAM DAC will start scanning this one and sending it to the screen and now you clear the back buffer which is this buffer this memory area and you draw your new scene on here and you keep alternating so now this is the back buffer and when you're finished you swap them out again now this one's the back buffer and this one's the front buffer now this one's the back buffer and this is the front buffer back and forth back and forth back and forth you draw here you draw here you draw here you draw here and that switching is called uh, flip flipping flippling no flipping or uh, page flipping so you flip between your uh, your different your two different frame buffers your front buffer and your back buffer and that's how you get shit done without like having half ass drawn shit appearing on the screen and like flickering sprites and shit like that now there's one small detail about flipping here and that is the timing of when you perform the flip to the new frame now you could just draw your back buffer and as soon as you're finished drawing your back buffer you could flip it and now it would start scanning this one and you could draw to this one but if you do that like let's say you have a uh, a scene okay let me set this up here so you have some uh, I'm just gonna have one object on the scene right you have a circle here uh, we'll put a square here too and we'll put a triangle here so here's the front buffer scene it's being drawn to the screen and uh, wait I'm gonna put the triangle here you'll see why in a second so here's the the last frame and that frame is being sent to the uh, screen it's being drawn on the screen so it gets drawn say it gets drawn about this far and here we have a triangle alright now we draw the new scene and in the new scene the square doesn't move but the circle moves to the right and the triangle says stays in the same spot and as soon as we're finished this one we flip the page what happens well now it was scanning up until this point and then you flip to this one so it starts scanning like this and your scene looks something like this so your triangle is fine because your triangle didn't move but your circle moved to the right so now you have a circle that's kind of like torn you got half from the previous frame circle and half from this frame circle the shit that didn't move here that's fine but because the circle moved you get like a little tearing effect now it's obviously not going to be this big it'll probably only be like a few pixels but if you have an entire scene that's moving from left to right or right to left and you flip your page in the middle of your uh, RAM DAC scan you're going to have something called tearing that's called scene tearing and that's a common graphics thing that happens even today and it, it can be kind of annoying it's not a big deal usually because the, it's only like going to be off by maybe two or three pixels at the most but it's still noticeable and that tearing will happen like it might happen here on one frame and then it might happen here on the next frame it might happen here it happens all around depending on the timing of when when you're finished drawing your frame 
And to avoid that um, tearing, what you do is you time your flips, your page flips, during the V-blank. Because during the V-blank, you're not drawing anything. So that's just the perfect time to flip the page and start displaying the new one. So doing that is called, uh, I think there's a Y in there somewhere, V-sync. So I'm sure you've heard of V-Sync if you've ever played with played a video game and you know changed the graphic settings. And that's what V-Sync does. It times the page flip so that it's uh, right on the vertical blank, right on the time when the uh, when the video display is not being updated. So that is V-Sync, and you can com combine V-Sync with page flipping to create uh, very seamless graphics. And it allows you to uh, alter the scene while the previous scene is being drawn. All right, so we've gotten pretty far. This is the basics of a gra graphics adapter. The very basics of a modern-ish graphics adapter. Now... How can we make this even faster? Well, the main slowdown in this system now is the fact that uh, sending data over from the uh, North Bridge to the South Bridge and over the uh, peripheral bus is very slow. This is obviously a lot farther away from the CPU than the RAM is. So it takes, it's just slow to send data to communicate from between the CPU and the graphics card. So what we could do to uh, speed this mother up is, well, let's say we have RAM here. And instead of storing our sprites in RAM like this and then transferring them onto our pages in VRAM, what we could do, wait, use my undo button, sweet. We could store our uh, graphics in VRAM and then copy them, say this is our, this is our, uh, or uh, what do you call it, a frame buffer, and we copy them from one location in VRAM onto the frame buffer. Now by doing this, we can use, we, we basically we install a processor, a graphics uh, unit, we'll call this, uh, we'll call it a GPU. We install a, a, a kind of uh, CPU type deal on our uh, on our graphics card on our graphics adapter. It's not a full-fledged CPU, but it has a few operations for basically copying blocks of memory, and it just copies blocks of memory from one part of VRAM to another part of VRAM. Now, because we're doing that, we need extra RAM. First of all, we need extra RAM to hold our uh, our sprites and our tiles and all the uh, the graphics that we're going to be needing. So we need uh, we need a frame buffer for the front buffer, we need a frame buffer for the back buffer, and then we need extra RAM for our sprites. And what happens is our GPU, or whatever you want to call it, will copy our sprites onto the current back buffer, whether it be this one or whether it be this one. And uh, by doing that, first of all, we, we skip, we don't have to go over the bus at all now. The only thing that needs to be sent over the bus is like a simple command from the CPU, copy the memory from here to here, just a small few bytes of command. And all that pixel data goes within the uh, graphics card, so it doesn't hit the bus at all. Much, much faster. And there's an added bonus, because all that copying is being done by the graphics card, 
during that time, the CPU can be doing other work. It can be uh, calculating stuff for the game. It can be doing AI calculations, physics calculations, anything. So you get a bit of a concurrent processing here where the, uh, the GPU and the CPU are running parallel. And you're getting a much, uh, much more efficient processing of your graphics. So this is the next speed up. And besides uh, doing block transfers, we they used to be called bit blocks because the, a single pixel in a black and white system, a single pixel is just one bit. So you would call a group of pixels a bit block. And when you transfer them, you'd call it a bit block transfer. And that would just be um, shortened to bit, blit, bit, block, transfer, bit, blit, or just blit. So whenever people talk about copying uh, blocks of video memory from one spot to another, basically drawing sprites or uh, tiles, they call it blitting because it comes from bit block transfer. Just a bit of, uh, bit of trivia for you there. So that's the main uh, speed up that you can get from adding uh, a processor onto your video card. You can get block transfers. You can also get the operations like drawing lines and shit. And that's good. That speeds things up a lot. But there is a problem with this. And the problem is like just take one manufacturer for example there used to be a manufacturer who made a lot of video cards called S3 and they made a lot of different uh, cards right and all those cards had different features and in order to access like I mean simple things like uh, accessing the video memory that was standard the video memory was always in the same location and uh, as long as you knew that location in RAM, which was always the same, you could copy to the video RAM. And changing video modes was also a standard. But as you added new features, these features were added and there was no standard. So the way to, um, to communicate with these different cards, uh, who, if someone was, for example, writing a game, depending on the card that you're using, you would have different commands in order to copy uh, blocks of memory or in order to set uh, a video mode or something. So if you wanted to write a game, you'd have to write different routines for every single card that was possible. So how do you... Uh, I mean, that's, that's crazy. You don't know what's going to be... And the thing is, is um, you write a game in 1983, if a new card comes out in 1984 with a different interface, your game won't work with that new card. It'll just, no, it just won't work. Sorry. So how do you solve this problem? Well, one way to solve it is with uh, a driver. And a driver is a piece of software. It provides a, uh, a standard interface to like a, an application, like a game or something. It's got a standard interface. Let's say that this is the interface. This looks weird, but... And here's your game, right? And your game fits right into that interface here. And then your driver will be able to um, hmm it's not really what I wanted to say what I'm trying to say here is you have a bunch of different cards right and every card has its own driver and it has a certain interface we'll call we'll say the interface looks like this you create an application that fits 
that interface. And it works with that driver, so it can work with this card. But, if a new card comes out, you create a different driver for that card, but you give it the same interface. So because the interface is same, now this driver will also work with this program, in theory. So your program can work with this card or this card. You, you don't have to reprogram your program to work with a different card. As long as the person making the, the card provides a driver with the same interface every time, your program, your game, will work with all those different cards. So if these are all uh, S3 cards made by the company S3, you can write one piece of code for accessing the video, and that piece of code will work with every, uh, every card from that company. So that's, that's where drivers come in. But, unfortunately, uh, you don't have just one company, right? You have a bunch of different companies. You have S3, and you have NVIDIA, and you have ATI, and you have Matrox, right? You have all these different companies. And they all have different ideas of how to make a graphics card. So the drivers from NVIDIA, right, their interfaces might look like, uh, might look like this. And the ATI interfaces, they might look like this, right? And the Matrox drivers interfaces, they might look like this. That's not a penis. Um, so it's all anarchy and like you have to basically write a different uh, different code for every different kind of driver and games they often had that kind of thing like if you look at an old DOS game and you go to the configuration they'll often make you choose what kind of uh, card you have what kind of sound card you have and sometimes what kind of video card you have because depending on that that'll that'll determine what code it uses to interface with the driver for your card but as you get more and more companies making more and more cards, it just becomes impossible for the game programmer to keep up with all that shit. So that is where your API comes into, into play here. Now what an API does is it stands in between your drivers call your driver and your your application or your game right so you have you have your device like this thing or this thing that's your device and you have your driver which is this piece of software here and instead of having your game in interface directly with your driver you put your API in between there call it uh, direct well we'll say direct 3d although back in the day there was no direct 3d but whatever um, and what does this do for us well direct 3d it exposes a very standard interface to your game so your game you write your game's graphics code based on this interface with Direct3D or with your API. And then your API basically it exposes another very standard interface to your driver and it forces all of the uh, companies to make their drivers the same and then your driver has whatever kind of weird interface it needs to communicate with the device. So instead of having one standard layer here, you're having two standard layers. One is a, uh, it's basically a promise between your game and DirectX saying that we're going to communicate like this. And then there's another promise between DirectX and the uh, 
the companies who make the the drivers saying you're going to make your driver like this so that it can communicate with the direct 3d and then the companies they do whatever they need to to get the the driver to communicate with the device properly so by doing shit like this now you just have to write one one set of um graphics routines and hopefully that will work with pretty much any device that supports direct 3d as long as the device has a driver that's compatible with direct 3d it's gonna work with your game probably usually like 97 percent of the time and um, I mean depending on the device the device might not support some feature so there might be no feature here and so the driver just won't support that feature and that means that if you write a game that tries to use this feature you're gonna get you're gonna get like an explosion and your programs gonna crash so what you need to do is you need to check and Direct3D gives you a, a means of doing this you check before you start using features you check to see whether the uh, the driver supports those features and if it doesn't support those features, then you say, okay, uh, we won't be using this part of the graphics API because it doesn't exist in the device. But yeah, basically, that is how it works between uh, your game, Direct3D, drivers, and the device. And that is the main reason why you do it that way. Because there's just so many fucking different devices and there's no way that a developer can keep up so you need a standard and that standard is direct 3d to the uh, developers it, it provides a standard interface as to how to get graphics onto the screen and to the uh, the makers of the the graphics hardware it provides a standard of how they have to make their drivers work in order to be to play nice with all the software so that my friends is basically direct well I wouldn't say direct 3D I haven't actually told you any 3D stuff but that's kind of direct mm, X graphics API that's graphics APIs in a nutshell that's what that is now the question on your minds now should be what's this thing here what is it actually this interface between the game and uh, D3D we want to know all about this we don't care about any of this shit because it's not important we need to know this interface and that's what I am here to teach you today uh, one second. So, what is Direct 3D? Direct 3D is in an API or an application programming interface. What it does, what an API does, is it allows software components to interface with each other. Generally speaking, you have some kind of um, client system like a game and you have some kind of server system like D3D and the API allows the game gives it a standard way of interfacing with the server D3D now usually this interface it uh, it represents a model of the system that you're you're interfacing with so you have, uh, let me just see here, you have some kind of model of the system. The system, in D3D, the system is the basically the graphics, uh, the GPU, right, the video card. And when you interface with D3D, you're interfacing with D3D's model of the graphics card. Now, in APIs, the model it can com be completely different than the way that the system actually is. 
but in general in direct 3d the model pretty is very close to the system you keep the model close to the system because you're you're very close the access to the hardware is actually very close in other systems the uh, the access to the graphics hardware is very abstract and not related to the actual architecture so in things like um, GDI or stuff like that it's a very high level API and it has very little to do with the uh, the way the hardware actually works but in direct 3d it's very close to the hardware the model reacts very much like the hardware the underlying hardware is working so you've got uh, you've got your client which is the game you got your server which is the uh, d3d system the subsystem and you've got your interface which is the uh, API the d3d API and the interface allows you to access some model and by accessing the model you are actually affecting changes on the on the system here which is the hardware so what we have to do if you want to learn the interface we have to learn the model first the model of how the things are inside of the D3D system and then we can learn the function calls that we use to uh, affect the model so what is the D3D model well, it's kind of complicated, but for uh, for the framework's purposes, there's not much to it. It's very simple. You have a few objects. They're very s similar to objects in C++. One object is... Uh, iDirect3D. It's an interface to a Direct3D object and what this object represents is it represents basically the entire graphics system in your computer it represents the the D3D API system the runtime in your computer so you get a, uh, a handle on this D3D system and what it allows you to do is it allows you to uh, to scope out all the different uh, hardware, the graphics hardware on the system, it allows you to uh, learn about the um, the capabilities of the hardware. And the most important thing it allows you to do is it allows you to create an ID3D device you create a device object and that represents the actual graphics card so this device object represents the hardware so you get a uh, a handle to this uh, Direct3D device which is a model of the, the actual hardware the graphics card and you you do a lot of operations on this direct 3d device in order to uh, to draw on the screen and do a bunch of shit so from this device you can get other uh, interfaces you can get an ID 3d surface a surface interface and that represents um, uh, a surface in video RAM VRAM so here's your VRAM and here's a little part of it that represents a surface so your ID 3d surface represents this and you can get a handle to that and you can manipulate the surface now this could be a, a back buffer or it could be a sprite basically a texture in memory but uh, you can get a uh, an interface to the surface and you could call a function that will return a pointer to the uh, the bits 
the, basically the pixels in the graphics memory. And once you have a pointer to that, then your game can directly change the bits in the graphics memory. And by doing that, change what's being displayed on the screen. And that, my friends, is what P Put Pixel is doing. So, in the framework, basically we use the uh, Direct3D surface interface to get a pointer to the, the bits. We use the ID3D interface to get the surface interface and we use it to flip the uh, flip the page between back buffer and front buffer and we use it to clear the screen and we use the uh, direct 3d device or just a direct 3d interface to get an interface to the uh, direct 3d device these are actually the only three interfaces we ever use in the in the game so far but of course there's tons of other things when you get into 3D, you've got vertex buffers and um, you've got shaders and well, all such a shit. I don't know. But for our intents and purposes, basically this is all we use so far. So now the only thing left is to look at the actual code and analyze it line by line. This might not make sense to you right now, but after we look at the code, hopefully it'll make more sense what I'm talking about here. So, I have in my window here, I have a, uh, a vanilla framework. This is the original framework, so there's no, no modifications, nothing made to it. And here we have the d3d graphics.h file. So this uh, declares the d3d graphics class it tells us what functions and what data are part of the class we've got a constructor a destructor put pixel begin frame and end frame and we have two pointers here we have a pointer to a direct 3d 9 interface interface to direct 3d and we have an interface to a direct 3D device, right? So that would be, again, this one and this one. Let me just delete that. So those are our two main interfaces that we store in the object. Now, as for functions, well, the constructor will set up direct 3D and the destructor will uh, break it down again. Put pixel will put a pixel onto the frame buffer, the back buffer. And begin frame and end frame are functions that you call at the beginning of when you're drawing a frame, when you're starting a frame, and end is when you're finished with the frame. And we'll, when we look at those, we'll see exactly what you have to do at the beginning and the end of a frame. All right, so that's the overview of our class. Now let's look at the implementation. All right. So the first thing you do when you're setting up Direct3D in a program is you have to create the uh, the direct 3d interface and you do that by calling direct 3d create and that gives us an interface into the whole direct 3d system it's our gateway into graphics so by creating this id 3d interface that will allow us to do to access a whole bunch of functions for direct 3d let me show you what i mean we'll just go down here and we'll go p direct 3d and we can look at a bunch of different uh, well, there's not too many functions but there's a few of them here obviously create device is important check device type check device there's lots of check device things it's a lot of the direct 3d interface is about uh, scoping out the system and determining what kind of uh, uh, capabilities it has like enum enumerate adapter modes will allow us to uh, to check all the different modes that we can use for um, graphics and get adapter identifier get a bunch of information get device capabilities so most of um, direct 3d 
the uh, Direct3D interface. Most of it is just about scoping out the system and picking a device that you want to uh, work with. And for just our simple little chintzy programs, we don't usually scope out. We just we just use the default adapter. If you look here, the next function call that we do, we'll ignore this for a second here, but the next function call we do is we do a uh, create device. So we use the Direct3D interface to create a device. And create device takes a bunch of parameters. The first one is the identifier of the adapter. That's its identifying number. And we just use the default adapter. So in systems with multiple video cards, we use the whatever one is default. The next thing we have is uh, D3D dev type. And we use HAL, which is hardware abstraction layer. I'm not even really sure what other types there are. We're al you're always going to use HAL. But, I mean, for those of you who really want to know, one second. All right, for those of you nosy buggers, you just have to know what device type means. I've got the, uh, the Microsoft website up here. So dev type is a numerated type that denotes the desired device type. So what kind of dev types do we have? Well, we have HAL, which is the main one, and then we have uh, null ref, ref, software, software, and this is not important. So what is um, HAL? Well, HAL is basically, it's saying use the hardware. But HAL stands for, and this isn't important, this is not important right now, but for those of you who want to know, HAL is the hardware abstraction layer. And what it does is HAL sits between basically your game and the driver. And what it does is if your game is trying to use a feature that the hardware does not support, it will support that feature in software. So, for example, if your game is trying to use, um, uh, I don't know, like a, a vertex shader or pixel shader, and the, the driver does not support pixel shading, uh, hardware uh, shading, per pixel shading, or what is it called? I forget. Shader model whatever, 1.2 or 2.0 or 4.0 or whatever. The hardware does not support some feature you're trying to use. The hardware abstraction layer will simulate that feature in software somehow. So it's abstraction because the, the game doesn't know, it doesn't have to know uh, what kind of features the driver has. It just uses whatever features it wants and the hardware abstraction layer deals with it either by forwarding that um, processing to the the hardware or by dealing with it itself. So that's what HAL is, hardware abstraction layer. And here we see hardware rasterization. Shading is done with software, hardware, or mixed transform and lighting. So it can do it in all software, all hardware, or it can mix it up depending on the situation. Now we're going to skip null ref because I don't really know what that is. But a reference driver means all features are implemented in software. And the reason you would want to use a reference driver is it, it behaves like a proper uh, hardware driver should behave. It behaves very well. And it, since it's all in software, it allows you to debug things really well. So if you're debugging a 3D program, it's often very useful, and I've done this in the past, to set the, the device type to reference. Because if you do that, you can actually peek inside of the uh, reference device, the simulated or the virtual software device, and you can see exactly how things are working or how they're not working. Whereas with a real hardware device, you're, you're basically, you can't see shit. Um, <clears throat> now, software device 
is a pluggable software device that has been registered with iDirect3D register software device. So this allows you to write your own software routines and then plug them in to uh, Direct3D and then you can use the Direct3D interface to work with that pluggable software routine. So that's what that is. Now aren't you don't you regret ever asking why what de device type is? So we use HAL because we want to use hardware as much as possible. Now the next thing that you have to pass in order to create your device is you have to have you have to pass it a handle to a window. So you have to have a window. It has to be a Windows program with a window, and you pass the handle of the window to the uh, function. Now we'll get to this later, but uh, this is basically the whole reason, or mainly the reason why we have Windows.cpp. We create a window because we need a window in order to create our device. So we, once we have a, a window, basically we can't create a device without a window. All right, what's next? Next is behavior flags. So these are a bunch of flags. And remember, remember when I taught you guys about uh, bitwise operators? That's the bitwise operator right there. It's used a lot in Direct3D to combine flags like these together. So, like I was, I like I was saying, you got these uh, behavior flags here. Um, where? Here. Combination of one or more of the options that controls device creation. So this controls the behavior of this function and how it creates the device. So D3D create. Uh, there's like a whole bunch of different things here that doesn't really make diff mm. Like for example, here's a one if you if you or this flag into the um, the parameter. Uh, it allows screen savers during a full screen application. Using this one specifies software vertex processing. Here's one that specifies uh, pure device. When you specify a pure device, you're telling D3D not to emulate any vertex processing. And that means if the device does not support vertex processing, the application can only use post transform vertexes. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, no window changes. D3D must not alter the focus window in any way. Multi-threaded. D3D to be multi-thread safe. Mixed vertex processing. Hardware vertex processing. Ah, uh, there's a whole bunch of shit. And depending on what you specify here, you're going to get different stuff. Here you can disable print screen and I don't know, a whole bunch of shit. <clears throat> So what do we use in our thing? We use uh, what I use is hardware vertex processing and pure device. Uh, actually, it's not that it's not that important for what we're doing right now because we're not doing any hardware 3D processing. So this doesn't do anything really. But uh, for people who are running on a system that has a crappy video card, these these settings will s prevent the create device from actually working. So if I specify hardware vertex processing and the device doesn't have hardware vertex processing this this create device call will just fail miserably and that is why uh, some of you might know from the forums I had to create a uh, a different version of the framework in order to accommodate people who have shitty video cards and uh, the way I did that was I just changed this from hardware and pure device. I changed it to software vertex processing. And that fixed it for most people. So yeah, that's what these flags are all about. There's a whole bunch of features. We don't use really many of them. Now, the last two um, parameters. The last parameter is a, um, a pointer to a structure. And that structure is D3D present parameters. That's this structure here. 
and it controls the presentation of the video data on the screen. So it has everything to do with the front buffer and the back buffer. It has to do with your frame buffers and it has to do with um, the flipping between the frame buffers. So I lost my uh, I lost my drawing of front buffer and back buffer. But you have a front buffer, you have a back buffer. Sometimes you even have more than one back buffer. You can have two or three back buffers. So uh, oftentimes video games have an option to do use triple buffering and that's if you have two back buffers and a front buffer. That's triple buffering. And all your 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 front buffer and all your back buffers together they're what you call a flipping chain right it's a chain because you first this one's the front buffer and the back one back and then after one frame this is the back buffer this is the front buffer front back and then after another frame this is the back buffer and this becomes the front buffer and then you go back to here right it's a rotation and it's called a flipping chain because it's a chain yes huh. I don't like explaining shit why am I even doing this so present parameters controls the flipping chain all about it so what kind of param first thing you do when you do this is you create a uh, you create a present parameters structure I'm gonna look this up on the interwebs because it might be useful. Uh, we'll go here, D3D present parameters. See, it has a whole shitload of um, members in this structure. Back buffer width, back buffer height, all that crazy shit. So the first thing you do is you reset all the memory in the structure because it's going to be just some garbage values, right? So you don't want garbage values in your present parameters. So you set it all to zero. And after you've done that, you set the you basically you set the parameters that you're interested in. So um, the parameters that we set are windowed. We make that true because obviously. Uh, all the um, things that we've been doing so far are windowed. If you set it to false, then it's going to be a full screen application. It's going to take up the whole screen. Next thing you set is the swap effect. Um, swap effect is basically um, what happens when you flip between your buffers, your front buffer and your back buffer. Um... What kind of swap effects do we have? Where's a swap effect? Here we go. Discard, flip, copy, overlay, flip, extended. Hmm. Discard has flip was created with this when a swap chain is created flip or copy, the rum ten guarantee that a percent will not affect the content of any of the back buffers. Alright. Unfortunately, meeting this guarantee involves substantial video memory or processing overheads, especially when implementing flip semantics for a windowed swap chain or copy semantics for a full screen swap chain. All right. So, what this is saying is um, normally when you're going to flip between uh, buffers, when you like let's say I'm just gonna erase all this here so let's say this one's a front back and another back buffer and once you've drawn a scene wait once you've drawn a scene here you flip from here to here so now this becomes the front buffer and this one becomes second back buffer first back buffer second back buffer back now normally 
from what I've shown you so far about hardware, you would expect the, uh, the previous scene to remain in here. And you might want to use that scene for some kind of effect, like some kind of blurring effect where you combine scenes together or whatever. I don't know. Um, you might want to be you might want to use the previous frame for some reason. Uh, however, in order to save processing time or memory or whatever, the hardware will often not guarantee uh, not guarantee this memory here. So after you flip, this will might become garbage or it might actually be another spot in memory. There's no guarantees. So if you want to guarantee it, then you have to choose flip or copy. But that guarantee uh, can involve substantial video memory or processing overheads. Basically, it can make your program run slower. So an application may use discard swap effect to avoid these overheads and to enable the display driver to select the most efficient presentation technique for the swap chain. Uh, this can only be specified when using value other than multi-sample none, blah, blah, blah. Multi-sampling is um, anti-aliasing, by the way. So you can't use discard with anti-aliasing. But choosing discard means you have no guarantee what's in your back buffer after you, after you flip. It won't be predictable. But it will allow you to... Um, I don't know, run your program faster and shit. Flip means that, um, flip is what I've been explaining to you guys up until now. You have multiple back buffers and it's a circular queue that includes the front buffer within this queue. And when a prevent present is invoked, when a flip is done, the queue is rotated so that the front buffer becomes the back buffer while the back buffer becomes the new front buffer. Basically this kind of deal here. Although usually we don't have uh, we don't have two back buffers, we only have one. So we have basically just alternating between these two. So that's the flip type of presentation. Copy means you have one back buffer and one front buffer and you draw on the back buffer and when, when you're done you copy it to the front and then you draw on the back and you copy. So obviously, copy is going to be slower than uh, flip because you have to copy all those pixels from the back to the front. Uh, yeah. So copy is slower than flip, but sometimes you have to copy. And the reason is, well, let me explain this because it's kind of important. When you're doing um, a full screen application, your, your program has full control over the screen. So everything that's on the screen is on there because your application wants it to be on there. In that case, flipping works great. You tell the, uh, you tell the RAM DAC, to fire the front buffer onto the screen while you draw on the back buffer. But if you're in a windowed application, you don't control everything on the screen. You only control this little part of the screen. So your back buffer, if you if for example, if your window is uh, say 800 by 600, your back buffer is only going to be 800 by 600, right? But this whole damn screen could be like 19, whatever, I forget what it is, by uh, 10, by 1080, right? So your window is only a small part of the screen. Flipping, it's impossible if you think about it. Because there's shit outside of your of your video memory that's going on the screen. So in a windowed mode, when you do a page flip, when you do a present, um, you're not actually uh, changing where the RAM DAC is pointing. The RAM DAC points to the real front buffer, which is the huge motherfucking full screen 1920 by 1080 or whatever it is. And when you present, you just copy 
your back buffer onto a little portion of the full screen front buffer which is your whole desktop basically so that's windowed mode is flipping by copying whereas in uh, full screen mode you can choose f real flipping or just copying in uh, windowed mode you're always going to be copying um, and I mean you might think well wow, that's really slow but actually the video card takes care of that all in hardware and it's super fast so it's not a huge difference but flipping is a little bit faster especially if you're doing like a whole fucking screen of graphics right like 19 whatever by 1080 then yeah flipping can give you a bit of a boost but if you're just doing like 800 by 600 it doesn't matter whether you flip or copy so don't worry about it too much and flip ex is adopting flip mode during this frame is passed instead of copied to the for composition when the application presenting the window. flip ex is like flipping in windowed mode it allows an application to more effect efficiently use memory bandwidth as well as enabling it to achieve full full screen present statistics flip mode does not affect full screen behavior sample ah uh, fuck i don't know I don't even know what this is, but no. I think that Flippy X is a little faster, but it only works in Windows 7 and so I don't use it uh, and that is I don't know what overlay is use a dedicated area of video memory so that can be overlaid on the primary surface no copy is performed when the overlay is displayed overlay operation is performed in hardware without modifying the data on the primary surface so overlay is used I think you can see overlays you often when you're uh, when you watch like a movie like in Windows Media Player or something, they use overlays. But, um, I don't know. We use Discard because it's the most efficient and it also works on uh, Vista and Direct and Windows XP. So we use Discard. So long story short, we use Discard. I'm explaining everything here, people. I'm fucking explaining everything. Uh, back buffer format. Now this allows us to specify the the format of the pixels in the back buffer, right? Uh, whether they're 32 bit or 16 bit. Let's see here. Uh, back buffer format, D3D format. See, here's all the different pixel formats that you can specify. Holy shit, these aren't not only pixel formats but also vertex data basically the formats of all the different kinds of buffers that you can have in uh, video memory so the format we do is we do D3D format unknown and what that does is that allows the um, it allows Direct3D to choose the format that's the same as the format of the uh, the current screen. In windowed applications the back buffer format no longer needs to match the display mode. The color conversion can be done by hardware. So if you specify a format that's different than the format of the desktop, what will happen is Direct3D, the hardware will have to convert all the pixels to the f the format of the desktop when it's presenting your screen onto the desktop. Uh, If you specify D3D format unknown in windowed mode, this tells the runtime to use the current display mode format and eliminates the need to call get display mode. So if we call, if we set format to unknown, that tells the, uh, wait, that tells the D3D create device to choose a format for the back buffer that is the same as the format for the, uh, the desktop. And that's very convenient. We could also call a function to get the format of the desktop. 
and then use that format in here, but uh, just using unknown will save us some effort. Presentation interval. That is that has to do with VSync. So if we say, well, let me just uh, bring this up. I've already explained VSync. Uh, presentation. Where is it? Interval. Here we go. The maximum rate at which the swap chain's back buffers can be presented to the front buffer. So we have do not flip. Use the front buffer as both the source and the target surface during rendering. Wow. I think that's the situation that I showed you guys before where you're drawing on the front buffer as it's being a frame sync is scheduled but the display surface does not change. So you're basically drawing to the video memory as it's being displayed on the screen and you can get like a whole bunch of fucked up shit. Then you have <clears throat> D3D present do not wait which means when you Wait. Uh, this isn't important. Do not wait means if we call the, f the function which does the flip and it's not ready to do flip, it will just return with an error. If you, uh, if you do d3d present wait, is there even a wait? No. So if you do not specify do not wait, what will happen is whenever you call the flipping function, which is present, um, and if it's at do not wait, then if it's not ready to present yet, the function will just return right away with an error. Whereas if you, uh, if you don't use this um, flag, and you call the present function, and it's not ready, the present function will just it'll block the processing, it'll sit in the in the present function until it's ready to present and then it'll continue. And that is the situation with the framework. It, it will just wait until it's ready to present and then it'll continue. We'll get there in a second. Uh, D3D present interval default. Interval 1, the driver will wait until the vertical retrace period to prevent tearing, which is what I showed you guys before, and present operations will not be affected more frequently than screen refresh. Runtime will complete at most one present operation per adapter refresh period. Right. So basically, it tries to uh, to copy a frame once every uh, refresh. Here. It will not copy, it'll copy once every two refreshes, every three refreshes, every four. And interval immediate will not wait for the vsync and it'll just copy as soon as you, as you call present. Uh, and the problem with that is that you could get tearing, right? Because you could be in the middle of a, um, a drawing a frame, the the RAM DAC could be in the middle, and then you do a present, and then the data changes, and you're going to get a scene that has some tearing in it. Uh, linear content, I have no fucking idea what all this shit is. Not important, not important. What is important is the interval here, immediate, and to a smaller extent, uh, do not wait. Do not flip, and I don't think we ever use that, but do not wait, you might use, and I don't know about this one. I don't know. Generally, we just use one. We try to draw one frame per uh, refresh. So, that is the present interval, drawing one frame per, uh, uh, wait, drawing one scene per refresh, I guess and synchronizing your presentation or your flipping with the uh, the vsync on the monitor 
And one other flag that we have to, to wait, in the present parameters, we set we can also set behavior flags. And the flag that we set here is lockable back buffer, which allows us to lock the back buffer, get a pointer to it, so that we can modify the back buffer from the CPU. Basically, this allows us to do put pixel. Without setting this flag, we would not be able to do a put pixel function because we would not be able to directly access the video memory. Uh, where's the flags? Flags. D3D present flags. So there's a there's quite a few present flags. Not in not useful. Restrict shared resource driver. Mm, I have no idea. Hint that it'll contain video data. Unpruned mode. Raw display mode. Hmm. I have no idea. No auto rotate. Rotated monitors are handled automatically with rotating copy during presentation, which is not very efficient. This flag means the application will perform its own display rotation. I guess this is more to do with like tablets and shit like that where the monitors rotate very often. I don't know. The important thing is lockable back buffer. I think device clip could also be useful. In a windowed present blit into the window area can within the monitor screen. Clip a windowed present blit into the window client area within the monitor screen. Uh, I don't really get what that means. Not important. The only thing really important in here is uh, lockable back buffer. All these other ones, I'm not sure. You might use uh, discard depth stencil in s if you're doing 3D shit. Drawn shadows or something, I don't know. But anyways, that is all of the uh, present parameters that we use when we create our device. And passing these parameters to the function will tell the function what kind of flipping chain to create for us. Now there's a ton of other parameters as you can see in here. Uh, Multi-sample quality. This one has to do with um, uh, what do you call it? Anti-aliasing. That's what it is. Multi-sample type. Yeah, this has to do with anti-aliasing. Back buffer count. This one you can get uh, wait yeah, you can get like triple buffering or whatever. Uh, you can set the back buffer height and width to be different um, sizes. We set we, what we do is we we leave this zero. We set it to null, which is zero. Uh, and what that does is it it tells the uh, create device to just choose the size of the window client area to be the size of the back buffer. So the back buffer will match the size of the window when this function was called. Uh, what else? We can set the screen refresh rate, which you can't do for windowed, obviously, because you don't control the entire screen. And in these days, I mean, most, uh, most LCDs don't have a, a lot of different um, refresh rates, you can't choose any rate you want, so it's better just to leave it uh, zero and let the uh, let the function choose the current refresh rate or the best refresh rate. So yeah, that's pretty much all of these uh, things here. All these parameters. Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting uh, thing here with these functions. We pass this structure to our uh, our create device function and we pass it by a pointer and it will read these values and use these values to create the uh, flipping chain that we want but it will also write values into this um, structure so if we look at if we look at uh, go back here if we look at the call here for create device, these parameters are input parameters, but the uh, pointer to the presentation parameters, this is input and output. 
So what we can do is after we call this function, we can read values in this structure and learn, uh, for example, we can learn what the format of the back buffer is. We set it to format unknown. But after we call create device, it's going to be set to some other value, the value of my desktop. Uh, so, let me just show you that right now, just for shits and giggles. Int v is equal to 1. I'm just going to call it, I'm just going to put that there. I'm going to put a breakpoint here. And no, I'll put a breakpoint here. I'll put a breakpoint here. There. I'm going to put this into deb debug mode. I'm going to build it. Should work. Okay, so we are at the create device function call. Let's look at our uh, D3D present parameters. So you see we got lots of zeros in here. The back buffer width and height are zero. The format is unknown. And all that happy crappy. Presentation interval is one. Flags. Lockable back buffer, so that's one, right? It's not showing me. Well, fuck you then. Um, now, let's step past the create device function. Create our device. Now look, all this shit has changed. Now we see our back buffer format is XRGB, 888, so it's 32-bit. The back buffer width and height have become 800 by 600. It got that because we have we passed it the handle to the window, so it could read the data from our window, and it learned that our window size was 800 by 600. So it used that as the back buffer, and all the other shit didn't change. But we could learn about uh, what kind of um, back buffer we have now after calling this. Now the thing is, I'm lazy, so I don't actually uh, check this value. I assume that everyone is using 32-bit. But if someone out there is using 24-bit or 16-bit color, the framework will just get all fucked up. Because <laughs> we're using, hold on, we're using XRGB here, and we're assuming that the size of these bits is the size of a D3D color, which is 32 bits. So uh, we assume stuff that we probably should check, but I mean, come on, everyone's running 32-bit color. If you're not running 32-bit color, then you're not my friend. So yeah, so sometimes function calls in uh, Direct 3D and in Windows in general, sometimes you pass values, but they're actually input and output. And sometimes you pass a value that's an output, and that's the next one here. This P device thing here, this is an output. So P device is a pointer to a device interface, an iDirect3D device 9 interface. And we're passing the address of the pointer. So think about that. A pointer is already an address, but we're not passing it the address stored in this pointer. We're passing it the address of the pointer. So, we have some variable in memory. It's a pointer. It's called id3d device 9 pointer p device. And it stores some address. And it has an address, right? So we'll say it's at address 0001. And when we pass this to the, um, the create device function, we don't pass this, uh, the value of this pointer. We pass its address. So create device it takes an id3d device9 pointer 
to a pointer, double pointer, double pointer to I direct 3 d device 9. And that allows create device to change the value of where this P device points to. So in the beginning, it's going to have some garbage or it's going to have a null value. It's going to point to nothing. And create device is going to change the thing that this thing points to. That's what the pointer to pointer is all about. It's about changing what this pointer points to. So instead of having it point to null, null, we're going to have it point to an I D 3 D device 9 interface. So we pass a pointer to a pointer, or we pass the address of a pointer. And it will fill this pointer with the address of a device interface. So it creates a device interface, and then it fills this pointer with a pointer to that device interface. So we have to take the address of a pointer. This is the address of a structure. So this is a normal passing by address, but this is passing by address of a pointer. So think about that because it's important. All right. So, and once we've gotten here, we've initialized our uh, direct 3D graphics object. The direct 3D create nine returned a pointer to Direct3D, and using that pointer to Direct3D, we create a device, and by passing it the address of a pointer to a device, it filled that pointer with the address of our uh, device interface. And now we can use that device interface to do shit. What kind of shit are we going to do? Well, the basic... Um, the basic sequence is you prepare a frame with begin frame, then you call put pixel to get your image onto the frame, and then you call end frame to present that frame to the screen or to do a flip or a copy. In our case, since it's a windowed mode, it's actually a copy. So to prepare the frame, all you have to do is you call the pointer to you you call clear on the device, and the clear function will clear the back buffer or it will set the back buffer to some value. So it takes a bunch of parameters. What does it take? Count D3D rect pointer to rects. Hmm. So I think it takes, first of all, it takes a number of rectangles and it takes a pointer to an array of rectangles. So you can tell, you can specify rectangles on the back buffer that you want to clear. But if we set it to zero and null, that means that we're going to be clearing the entire back buffer. Then you have flags, which defines the behavior of the clear function. And uh, I don't know what this flag specifies, really. I guess I could look it up if you really want me to. Uh, D three D device nine clear fuck reset fuck I just want to clear ah uh, you are such a dick okay I'm gonna look in this uh, I direct three D device nine and we'll look at clear. Here we go. So, number of rectangles in the array of P rects. Pointer to an array of rectangles that describe the rectangles to clear, like I said. And D3D clear flags target, clear a render target, or all in a multiple render target. All right. So, this basically, target means clear the back buffer. Stencil means clear the stencil buffer. Z buffer means clear the depth buffer. All right. Stencil and depth buffer are, are these things are they have to do with 3D rendering. So don't worry about it right now. Worry about this one. D3D target that tells it to clear the back buffer. Then this is the color. And this is fuck I don't know. 
There's a floating point value here somewhere. I think this is for clearing a uh, Z buffer. Let's let's take a look. Go back. I said go back, you jackass. Uh, float. Clear the depth buffer to this new Z value. So this is for clearing the Z buffer, and this is for clearing the stencil buffer. Interesting. So you could actually clear the the render target, the depth buffer and the stencil buffer all in one call just by using these flags so if you or these three flags together it'll clear them all at once alright and that is the clear so this clears the screen gets us ready for a new frame then the fun begins because we have to uh, we call put pixel and that will allow us to uh, draw a pixel on the screen now, in order to draw a pixel, in order to m when we draw a pixel, like I said before, we just move pixel data into the video memory. And in order to do that, we need to get a pointer to the video memory. So, we create a pointer to an interface here, back buffer. It's an I Direct 3D surface interface, which I drew here, I Direct 3D surface. That's this thing and it represents some video memory so we have a pointer to a surface interface and we have a rect structure which represents a D3D locked rectangle so what we do is we call we use the device interface to call the get back buffer function and this will get us an interface to our back buffer. The, the back buffer always existed. We're not creating a back buffer. We're just getting an interface to our back buffer. So we call, we use a bunch of things here, and this will just get us our default back buffer. You can specify values here. I don't even know what these fuckers are. What is that? Swap chain, that will specify which swap chain, and this specifies which back buffer in that swap chain. And this specifies the type of the back buffer. And this is again a pointer to a pointer or the address of a pointer. So this will fill our back buffer pointer with the address of the interface to the back buffer. Then we use the back buffer interface to lock a rectangle on the back buffer. And we, we use uh, null here. This is a pointer to a rectangle and flags. This will just lock the entire back buffer and we pass it a point to this rectangle and it will change the values in this rectangle to represent the values of the back buffer so what values does a rectangle have? a D3D locked rect? I'm glad you asked it has two values, the pointer to the bits which is the actual pointer to the um, the buffer and the pitch now the pointer to the bits is a void pointer we see uh, p bits. That's a void pointer, because different video modes will have different sizes for the data. So some video modes will have 16-bit pixels, and some will have 32 bits. So you can't tell what type of pixel you're going to get from this call. So it's a void pointer, and you have to convert that with a cast to whatever uh, pixel type it is. So I convert it here to a uh, D3D color, which is a D word, or a 32-bit pixel type. I'm assuming the pixel is going to be 32 bits wide. Uh, but like I said before, if someone's running their desktop at 16 bits, this is going to fuck them up. So it's, it's a bad assumption, but it'll work most of the time, because everybody these days runs 32 bits. So this gets us our pointer. And we convert that pointer, we uh, cast it to a pointer to D3D color, or a pointer to a D word. Basically, a pointer to an int is what it is. And then we use the, um, we use the indexing operator here on our pointer to index into the, the array, which is just the surface, right? And we calculate the... Uh, the index into the array based on the x value plus y times the pitch divided by 4. Remember, remember when I talked about bit shifting? If you bit shift to the right once, 
you're dividing by 2. So if you bit shift to the right twice, you're dividing by 2 twice, which is dividing by 4. So I could say rect.pitch shift right twice. That's exactly the same as saying divide by 4. Um, why did I shift right? Because I felt like it. But, I mean, there's no good reason these days. Back in the day, dividing was really slow. So shifting would allow you to save some clock cycles. But these days, it's not a big deal. I think shifting is still a little bit faster, though. And since um, we call this function, we call put pixel all the time, it's not, it doesn't hurt too much to shift like this. Now, you guys probably, re you, you're very familiar with x plus y times width, right? I hope you're familiar with that idea. But what's this pitch bullshit? Is that the width of the, um, the surface? It's, you'd think it is the width, and it's very similar to the width, but it's not the width of the surface. Pitch and width are slightly different. Now, do you guys remember when we loaded bitmaps and we had 24-bit pixels? But if you remember, a single uh, row, it had to be a multiple of four. The, the, the bytes in a row had to be a multiple of four. And if they didn't line up, you would have, let's say you have three bits, three bytes here, you'd have padding. So this would be your actual image data, and then you'd have three bytes of padding so that the whole thing ended up being a multiple of four. You remember that, don't you? You didn't forget, did you? Well, it just so happens that video card memory also likes its, um, uh, it likes its rows to be in a multiple of some value. It could be a multiple of four, but it could be a multiple of like something else, like a multiple of 256 or 512. And that, that the reason is, is because video cards have very wide memory access um, throughput pipes, I don't know. And so it helps if the, uh, the rows of um, pixels, if they line up with the memory access lines or whatever. So the thing is is that every video card is different. They don't all have the same uh, alignment requirements. So when you call uh, lock rect, it fills the back buffer with the pitch of the uh, row. The pitch is just the the size of the row the actual width of your buffer plus the padding the width plus the padding equals the pitch so this whole thing here is the pitch so if you want to find any pixel in here you would multiply the x you'd add the x to the y times the pitch x plus y times pitch and sometimes that will be exactly the same as x plus y times width, but sometimes it's going to be different. So you never know, but you can't go wrong if you're using the pitch value. Now the thing is, is that the pitch is in um, bytes, but, that's 8-bit values, right? But D3D color is 32 bits. So the indexing won't work if you're trying to uh, index using uh, the byte value. So you have to divide by 4, and that will take the, the pitch in bytes, and that will give you back a pitch in uh, D words, right? It will give you the pitch in D words. So how many D words wide the pitch is? Because we're treating this as a D word pointer. We're only interested in D word sizes. Um, now, I don't think this will ever be the case, but if there is a case where the pitch is not a multiple of four, you're going to be fucked. <laughs> but I think it's always going to be a multiple of four. I'm 
like 99.99% sure it's always going to be multiple of 4. So this will be fine. But the basic idea here is you, you take your pitch in bytes, you divide it by 4, so now you have a pitch in D words or in pixels. This gives it our, this turns it from bytes, byte units into pixel units. And once we have this in pixels, in X and Y are also in pixels, then we can index into our array in pixel units. So we get our index, we copy our value, which is which was passed to put pixel, RGB. We use this macro to pack them into a single 32-bit value, and we slam that 32-bit value into memory at our indexed pointer location. And then our pixel is in memory. Hallelujah! So after we're done that, we, uh, we unlock the rectangle. Because when you lock the rectangle, I, I explained this before in Lesson 13, but when you lock the rectangle to get the pointer, you're also telling the uh, graphics card that it can't do anything else with that memory. So if you keep the, the, the back buffer locked, and then you try to clear or try to present, you're going to get an error because it's locked. And the only thing who can touch it is the CPU. So you have to unlock it when you're finished copying your pixel. And that will make it free for any other operation like clear or present. So you lock it to get your pointer, and then you unlock it to make it available for other calls. And then we release the back buffer because we're not going to need it anymore. And that is put pixel. And after you're done putting all your pixels onto your buffer, you call present. And I don't know if I have it here. That will copy your back buffer onto the screen in windowed mode. Or if you're in full screen mode, that will flip your back buffer and your front buffer in full screen mode, which we haven't done yet. But we'll get to full screen mode fairly soon, I think, in the tutorials. So present takes a bunch of parameters. You can present only a portion of the buffer. You can only copy a portion by using uh, source rect and destination rect. Instead of flipping the whole or presenting the whole screen, you can present just a portion. Uh, you can override which window is the destination for the thing. So if you have multiple windows, you can choose a different window for the destination. And this is dirty region. I have no idea, really. It has to do with dirty regions are regions of uh, of a screen that need to be updated because they've been drawn over or they've been invalidated. But it's not important for us. We just make these all null, which means basically copy the entire back buffer onto whatever the target front buffer is, whether it be some region of the desktop or whether it be the entire full screen window in full screen mode. Normally with present, you don't, have to, you don't have to pass it shit. You just tell it, do the default, and it'll do its dirty work. So, that is all of the... Uh, oh, wait. One more thing. When you're finished with your graphics and your D3D graphics object is dying, and it's in its death throes, you have to release the device to make everything nice and clean. It's like um, when you allocate memory with malloc. You have to uh, free it, and when you allocate memory with new, you have to delete it. Well, when you call create device, and you get a interface to device, when you're finished, you have to release that interface, so you call release. And then you make the pointer point to null, just to signify that it's not pointing to anything useful anymore. And we call if p device just to check to make sure that the p device is pointing to something real. And if it is, then we release that thing and we make it point to null. And the same thing for uh, our Direct 3D. We got a pointer to Direct 3D by calling Direct 3D create. So we have to release that pointer to the Direct 3D interface by calling release and then sending it to null. And that, my friends, is how we use Direct 3D to get shit on the screen. Now, in I'm sure you guys are remember, and if you don't, you can go back to it, but in Lesson 13, we changed put pixel because locking the back buffer and unlocking it, probably locking it is the worst, it takes a lot of time. So if you have to lock the back buffer for every single pixel you put on there, that is incredibly fucking slow. And I think you guys will agree, like when you did the uh, 
the was it lesson nine thing where you draw like the rectangle and resize it that got super fucking slow because you're putting a lot of pixels onto the screen and all that locking and unlocking was taking a huge amount of time so in lesson 13 we changed this uh, put pixel and what we did was we moved the locking code into the begin frame and we moved the unlock into the end frame so you only locked the back buffer after you cleared it, you would clear the back buffer and then lock it. And it would stay locked throughout the entire frame until you're ready to present. And then you would unlock it and present. And in between that time, you would hold the uh, rectangle that would be a, uh, a member variable of D3D graphics. And you would just remember the pointer throughout the duration of the frame. And that worked out very well. That gave us a huge speed up. And there are other speedups on the way. But that's another story. So this is how Direct3D uh, works for us. It's very simple. You create, your, uh, you create your device. Then you get a pointer to the back buffer. And you draw your pixels. And you just clear the screen. And when you're done, you present. Now, if our game has a full background where it actually overwrites the entire screen, we don't need to call clear in that case. So if you have a full background in your game or like tiles that cover the entire screen, you don't need to call clear. But for most of our stuff up until now, we've just been using like a black or a white background. So we use clear because it's very fast. It's all in hardware. Um, yeah. That's that. That's it. So, in the next lesson, I'm going to be explaining to you guys this part of it, which is the direct, uh, wait, the Windows part. And I'll explain how we get that uh, elusive hwind value here by using create window. And how, uh, how the message procedure works together with the win main to get us our uh, window. And how we can get messages about uh, the keyboard and I'll probably explain the mouse shit too and I'll explain the message uh, pump here this loop here that gets messages and calls our the game go function which runs our whole entire game so next lesson is on windows oh my throat is so fucking sore now so until then Bye. <laughs>